ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೇತನ ಚಂದ್ರಜಿ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಅಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟ್ ಮೈ ಹಂಬಲ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಟು ಬಿ ಹಿಯರ್ ವಿತ್ ಯು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ವೆರಿ ಮಚ್ ಪ್ರೋಜಿ ಟುಡೆ ಫಾರ್ ಅಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಮೈ ಇನ್ವಿಟೇಷನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಐಮ್ ವೆರಿ ವೆರಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಟು ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಆಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಐ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಹಿಯರಿಂಗ್ ಯು ಟೆನ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಅಂಡ್ ವೆನ್ ಐ ಆಸ್ ಅ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ ಕಾನ್ಸ್ಟೆಂಟ್ಲಿ ಎವ್ರಿ ಡೇ ಆಲ್ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಹಿಯರಿಂಗ್ ಯು ಅಂಡ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಮೈ ರಿಯಲಿ ಎ ಮೋಟಿವೇಶನಲ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಇನ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕಾನ್ಷಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಮೈ ಡಿಫಿಕಲ್ಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ಸ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ವೇಸ್ ಟರ್ನ್ ಔಟ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಹೆಲ್ಪಿಂಗ್ ಮೇ ಬಿ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣಾಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ರಿಯಲ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಸೊ ಟುಡೆ ಪ್ರೂವ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಇಂಡಿಪೆಂಡೆನ್ಸ್ ಡೇ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಟು ಸಿ ಯು ಸೊ ಟುಡೆ ಐ ಥೋಟ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ ಆನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಡಿಪೆಂಡೆನ್ಸ್ ಹೌ ಇಟ್ ಕಮ್ ಅಂಡ್ ವಾಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ದ ಮೇಜರ್ ಇನ್ಸಿಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ how popad bringing into the <clears throat> popad role during that independence these are few points in my mind so maybe we can we can start with your thoughts on the independence hari krishna thank you thank you for inviting me today prabhu so happy to be here with you and since we have met several years ago and it's been last one year when we interacted more and more i've seen how resourceful dynamic cheerful you are so yes this is a good occasion to con- contemplate on independence and i have thought about how oh, my own vision of independence and immense day celebrations has changed over the years oh. as a child when i grew up i grew up with a lot of patriotic sentiments and when my maternal uncle had Uh, had a company in america he wanted me to come to america i had done well in gre also uh, but before that also i was always in two minds <laughs> i had this idea of brain drain <laughs> india <laughs> indian brains going to the west and the idea was west is like a drain it's just going away from india draining away from india <laughs> so at that time i had told my uncle i am a i am a patriot i will not come oh then he had said that if you are a patriot you should come <laughs> he said <that. laughs> he said he had said that indians can do a lot for india even in the west oh so, so that answer surprised me so over a period of time my own understanding of things in black and white has become more and more shaded so the idea that you reject one thing to accept another thing mm-hmm. our indians in america are a big asset for india not only they give bring a lot of foreign exchange but they bring also goodwill to india oh. they are a significant force of of influence in america so like that also they well there was a lot of patriotic sentiment mm. for me sare jahan se acha the kind of songs i would like to sing and recite then what is that zara aankh mein bhar lo pani that was a very moving songs yeah so from that point onwards when i was introduced to bhakti i thought this is all just mundane mm. that but then Oh, as my understanding of bhakti and bhagavad gita's wisdom has increased i've also begun to realize that that bhakti itself and bhagavad gita itself offers us a not a vision of rejection but yeah. rejection of connect, connection a rejection of a deeper connection mm-hmm. a deeper appreciation so that's what i would like to probably share over this podcast today later yeah thank you that's a nice uh, na- mean itself is a itself is a good food for thought that how when we introduce to krishna consciousness our perspective changes actually and yes how, yes yeah generally we come when we come to the movement we come with our own thoughts our ideas our perspective and then we may start introducing but with the philosophy when we read books then it got filtered out and we also evolve I means every year we evolve so i am very excited to hear from you about your thoughts on this So let's start. Sure. Sometimes we see spiritual life and material life as disconnected. That means you know say everything material is maya and spiritual is krishna. But over a period I realized that it's a progression. what we have learned in the material life or the appreciation in the material life we are building on that so in one sense uh, now when i look at the independence day celebration or independence day at, at large i can see it with far greater appreciation than what i was seeing it before 
So in many ways, spiritual growth is essentially a growth in appreciation. It is a growth in appreciation of what is already pleasant, present in our life. So I was with uh, Shruti Dharma Prabhu, who was the temple president of the Manor Temple, and he told me that he is regularly invited to London for uh, in London. They are based in London, the Manor. They are invited to the British House of Commons and other places to speak. So, for example, Britain also has its own national days. When they are invited to speak over there, I asked him, what do you speak? He says that we speak about gratitude to the country because the country has given us religious freedom and religious rights by which you can practice what or practice our faith. So I thought of that such a, as a, such a beautiful way of looking at it. If we consider that a country that does not have the Vedic tradition as its main tradition, if a devotee can appreciate even that, then how much more should we be able to appreciate the country where the Vedic tradition has been present for millennia, where mm. spirituality has been prominent uh, since time immemorial, and where from where we ourselves have got it and we were born over here. So in that sense, it's a richer way of looking at it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Could... Yes. So if I say the KC vision, you know, a country like UK, you can have religious rights and especially religious freedom. So a devotee can appreciate everything. And what to speak of India, India is not only having us that for both of these are their rights and freedom, but beyond that, this is the, in some ways, a, the home or at least the origin in the material world, then it is, it is existing and to some extent prominent flourishing even now. And it is filled with, filled with uh, sacred places, yeah. which remind us of spirituality. So there are so many ways we can appreciate the spirituality of India and that spirituality of India is accessible to us. So in many ways, the spiritual, for it to be accessible, the political is important. Krishna descends in one sense to bring about political change. Dharma Samsthapanarthaya is actually political change. <laughs> Duryodhana, was, Duryodhana was ruling and Krishna established Yudhishthira as the king. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Sometimes the word politics has a negative connotation. Negatively, it means that it's like manipulating, backbiting, groupism. But at a positive level, it just means governing. Mm. So like we have political science or political philosophy. It is not the science of manipulating. <laughs> that refers to the point about governing. Yeah. So this is Krishna bring, wants to bring about, bring about material change. That means he wants to bring about a, a, a government, a so, not specifically government, you could say, but a social order, which is led by the government in many ways, a social order that is conducive to spiritual growth. So, social order mm. that is conducive to spiritual growth. Now, how conducive, how long? That can vary from place to place. That can vary from situation to situation. But that is what is the aim. So now India is definitely providing us a lot. And we can say the, well, we can say, say there's a lot that is problematic with India, but a lot that is right also. So we are able to practice our dharma. We are able to share dharma with others. We are able to share, not just practice dharma and share dharma. We are also able to practice and share bhakti with others. So in that sense, we have, from just a point of view of ordinary gratitude also, we have much to be grateful for. And this became, relatively speaking, significantly easier for us to practice because India had, to some extent, political independence. 
so that's one way we can look at the the first ways we say look at the independence day Sp spiritually as it was a day which brought greater facility hmm, for greater political facility you can say for practicing both dharma and bhakti both Wow. So that's the first you are looking at it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Pro. Actually, uh, because today is India, everyone is celebrating this Independence Day, and uh, that that's why this topic is re really relevant for all the devotees and even for every Indian, every person on this plan, on this on this land. Now, recently, you know, uh, they changed. They start saying that we will not use word India, but they will go mm. for Bharat. So, how do you reflect to this one? So, in the, even in our discussion also in some other time, you mentioned that even as a movement, as an institution, we are also coming up with the with the word Bharat now. And G20 has also arrived into this with the Vasudeva Kutumbakam. So, how do you reflect to this this transition? Yes. So there is there are two ways of looking at it you know the name it is it is a, just a pointer to the substance so that's say shakespeare's famous quote that that what's in a name a rose will smell just as sweet if called by any other name <laughs> so <laughs> so in that sense whether we refer to it india or bharat the substance is the same it's one way of looking at that. the name is just a pointer to the substance true, true. but another is that the name is not just it's a not just a pointer it's a reminder of the substance mm -hmm. okay so when i'm pointing means you know whether i use this finger to, whether i use this finger to point or this finger to point or this finger to point it really doesn't matter just a pointer same thing but reminder means it's intrinsically there is something more significantly so if the use of Bharat serves as a reminder, mm -hmm. Bharat is actually, Bha comes from Bhaskara. Bhaskara is the sun. It yes. represents light. And Ratha refers to absorption. So ideally speaking, what this meant to be is that the land of the people who are absorbed in the light of wisdom. So it's quite a profound name yeah now there's nothing wrong with india but india so you could say bharat is more like a philosophical name but india is simply a geographical name that wow. it arose it's prim, arose primarily from the idea that in this people who were on this side of in sindhu river they came in sindh hind gradually became india so in the same it comes primarily from that root so um so i would say that if Bharat, the change of the name, if using the name Bharat is a reminder of the spirituality of Bharat, it is a reminder for us to learn the wisdom and share the wisdom, then definitely using Bharat is great. But if it just becomes a tool for create for scoring political brownie points over others, then if I use Bharat, mm -hmm. then I'm a greater patriot. And if you use India, then you are sold out to Western interests. Okay. If it becomes like, if it, so it's with what intention it is being used, that is important. But certainly, if it is, if it is used with a deeper intention, then it's positive. It can remind us of, of so many, so much of the spirituality and yeah. the wealth of wisdom that is there in India. Yeah, I appreciate the way you explained it, Pruji, about this India is it's a more of a geographically and Bharat is more of a philosophically. And the explanation of this word Bharat, I think in the very way back when you were explaining the characters of the Mahabharat, and then uh, the first time I get to know about okay, what exactly Bharat means. In the lectures of Pavapad, we heard that how Bharat word came into the existence and how you explained the Bharat right now uh, and then Mahabharat. And I think there, there must be some correlation between this when you mentioned that illuminating and rata riti means they are absorbed and bha means there is there is effulgence so just like in the bhagavad gita also 
jnana deepena bhashvata it comes so would you like to means it just come in my mind only <laughs> maybe mm, good point correction yeah. so. see bharat also was a genealogical name hmm? that means a particular dynasty a kings a particular king was named bharat now the multiple kings were named bharat or bharat so from them also the name has come about but generally if you consider nouns they are is a common noun and a proper noun so mm -hmm. proper noun means it refers to a particular person so for example the america is a country mm -hmm. but there is all there can also be a person named mr america okay <laughs> <laughs> some people surname might be mr america or a, it's not very common it is a, often more of a title of somebody who's won a particular contest miss america or mr america but it could be like that so bharat in india can, is also name of people it's more bharat but similarly bharat so it could be both names it can, so when it's a proper noun it refers to a particular person when it's a common noun it refers to a particular attribute hmm? so bharat as a philosophical name it refers to one who is in the light of the wisdom so the mahabharat of course is a description of the great story of the descendants of bharat mm. so it can also also refer to the story of incidents that happened in bharat but it's more specifically it refers to the the puranas and specific the itihasa specifically centered on one particular dynasty one particular set of individuals with one generation within the dynasty ramayana is centered on ram the mahabharata centered on little more it's not just one generation it starts from bhishma and goes down so it's a great descendants of bharat of the bharata king so that's one thing now when you talk about jnana deepena bhasvata that's so we could say that the bhagavad gita in one sense was intended to fulfill nama sarthak kari you can say that dharma sarthak like that nama sarthak kari so to fulfill the import of the name so that knowledge with which the people of india are meant to be illuminated yeah. that knowledge is provided in the hearts and lives of individuals through the bhagavad gita so bhagavad gita you can say it fulfills the import import means the intent the significance of the name bharat mm -hmm. in one sense the more we study the bhagavad gita the more we immerse ourselves in its wisdom then we will actually become absorbed in light so you know this could bring us further to the sick purpose of the independence struggle that it was not just to to get political independence which is important no doubt but beyond political independence see many of india's political leaders uh, are india's india's freedom fighters those who thought political independence they also had a spiritual purpose for political independence oh if you consider how's that yes you said if you consider for example the leaders like uh, the the bankim chandra rai or rabindranath tagore those who wrote vande matram and <clears throat> and uh, janaka namana yeah. these are people who are actually quite appreciative of india's vast spiritual tradition yes and they also saw many of them saw india's struggle for independence as a means to better access and reclaim india's spirituality gandhi ji of course was himself quite spiritual his understanding of spirituality Uh, might have been particularly individual and idiosyncratic to some extent but um, but overall so the purpose was there that india attains political independence and that's just one step forward towards actually occupying its place in the world through making due contributions mm -hmm. Hmm. True, true. So you have just entered into this discussion, 
maybe actually it was in my mind also that in that how was the situation during this uh, 1947 that you touch this point that yes political leaders they were thinking that yes when they will be get independence and that they will they want to bring the spiritual part of our country on the front front forefront can you can you put some more light over there that what exactly happened with yes it's an independence day then how do you see the independence basically how exactly it happened yeah. be brought well in there are multiple reference points look at this if you consider india from 47 to say 1947 2023 mm -hmm. if you consider india's journey mm -hmm. There are multiple reference points. Say, for example, if we consider it compared with several African countries. Okay. Hmm, they have done far, and they have many of them are devastated. Even even if you consider our old friend. <laughs> that is also degenerating. <laughs> In Pakistan, we have not had a single government that has completed its tenure. Oh. Um, if you can so in in compared to a majority of countries which were in a similar situation in india a similar situation to india after the second world war basically they were colonized and they got independent mm -hmm. as compared to majority of them india has done significantly better oh but you could say there are some countries you can say singapore they have done Japan, better than us huh? yeah and china they have done better than us. Oh. So overall, we could say that uh, it's we could say what India has achieved is good, but not great. And uh, considering where we were at the time of independence, we could say that uh, definitely what has been done is, is significant. Of course, Japan and Singapore are different because they're very small countries. So managing them is not that difficult. Yes, China is huge, but then China has uh, has a more of a autocratic kind of government. So how sustainable that form of government is open to discussion. China mm -hmm. see one of the, one of the challenges is that China does not have as much diversity as India has. Mm -hmm. They had diversity in the past, but it's more of significantly less now as compared to. So so I would say that we have done a decent job. And there is definitely much more to be done. Mm. So, but the two incidents because of which we could say so politically, if you consider it's a decent job. Now, if you consider the mission, you want to say something before I go to the, the spiritual growth of India that I wanted to go towards. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so maybe, yes, you can reflect on this only that. Yeah. So in my understanding, you know, two things went really, if you consider India's spiritual growth, it is almost like down and down. Mm -hmm. Two major incidents that happened, 1947 itself was the partition, and the partition was a horrendous affair. And after that, in 1950, was the assassination of Gandhiji. So, now in both of these, something negative was in. So partition, it was felt that the you know, religion itself will stop India from progressing. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That you know, religion caused so much conflict. It's an obstacle to progress. Hmm. And then now historically, there could be many reasons uh, why Gandhi was assassinated. And it's not a justification at all of it. What was done was horrible, but basically it ended up that Hinduism was blamed for this. Yeah, the person who assassinated him was an ex member of a Hindu group. Yes. So now because of that, the government systematically started sidelining religion in general, and Hinduism in particular, from the from the government's focus. Hmm. Now, religion was very religion in particular, for general and Hinduism in particular was very deeply etched in the Indian psyche. So that didn't go away, but the government's focus. So secularism in India 
the idea of secularism itself has over the years degenerated originally secularism meant neutrality toward religions the government doesn't favor any particular religion but over time it became apathy toward religion neutrality means i won't support anyone apathy means i don't care at all okay. mm -hmm. and then from there it went down to antipathy oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. so now this is just an obstacle this is a cause of problems so one, the first political first prime minister of india he said that the industrial centers the industries are the actual temples of india they will lead to progress what are the what are the temples done for the country the mm -hmm. actual temples done for the country so he he basically sec, along with secularism india adopted socialism yes follow so, so, uh, socialism is was is quite close to communism which is aggressively atheistic so from a political perspective the support that the political machinery could have provided for mm -hmm. rejuvenating india's culture india's tradition that didn't come at all so there's no support a significant level of opposition also hmm. and uh, then of course further things happened there's always uh, while the antipathy was there were there towards hinduism but there was also the pandering to the minorities for political bank, political vote banks yeah and because of that there was a con continuous oh, continuous sidelining of dharma of sanatan hmm. dharma we can say yes and it uh, there was a brief resurgence now if you see from this perspective uh, we can understand the significance of what shila prabhupada did in 47 india got independence in 65 shila prabhupada went to america in 70 he came back and 70 to 77 yeah he was mostly is based in india he was traveling abroad but he was based in india yes so now you see prabhupad prabhupad lived through the war and in 44 and the war basically started from 39 it was 39 to 44 but if you say around around 44 and before that yeah. bengal was quite severely hit by japan so prabhupad lived through that war yeah. and prabhupad also lived through the partition now by the time of the 60s if you consider 60s there was this disconnect with mm. respect to say sanatan dharma on mm. one side there was a disconnect that there was the governmental apathy apathy was great was increasing sorry and you meant to say that yes what i what i'm got from this that after 47 yes the government was sidelining the, yeah, the government was sidelining yeah. now there was there was popular support was still there hmm? that in, people wanted to practice people wanted to people wanted in one sense to show to the world that india is great okay hmm? and they were thinking of not i would say not support so much as you know, at a popular level, practice was still there. But the government often saw oh. Sanatan Dharma as a source of embarrassment for India. You know, that this is something which is holding us behind. Why is this so much there in our country? Hmm? But when Prabhupada came to India and he brought Western people oh. who had not only adopted Indian wisdom, hmm. Hmm, but also adopted Indian culture in terms of their dress and their lifestyle. So it was, so what happened was they saw that what you are practicing, it's not a source of embarrassment. It's a source of pride. It's a source of glory. And it was sensational at that time. Yes. So it was completely opposite in one sense to the narrative that was being peddled by the government. Hmm. Oh, India is primitive, and if you want to go into modernity, then we had to give up our religion. But what happened was those who are considered the beacons of modernity, Americans. Yes, and they adopted. They are adopting this, so it was sensation. Wow. In fact, at that time when Prabhupada did the big 
I think uh, Sadhu, uh, Sadhu Samaj festival in Mumbai. Uh, there was a report in the Times of India, and he said that India has been conquered so many, many times by so many rulers, but now this will be a cultural conquest by India of the West. Wow! So that was the headline there in the newspaper. By there, it is a gushingly um, positive rave review, as you might say. Yes. It was like that at that time. So. Because Prabhupada played no small part mm -hmm. in it was a significantly big part in the reawakening of national, you could say national pride. Now national pride can be a bad thing if it just simply makes us arrogant. Yes. But national pride can be a good thing if it also if it makes us explore, if it makes us look at take a deeper deeper look at mm -hmm. at uh, at our own tradition. You know that in India, just to complete this point. Before the IPL started, <laughs> so before before we said India was often we say India is a cricket mad country. Hmm? Yes, but actually, it is more like a India is a international cricket mad country. That means yes, in yes. Ranji Trophy, in Ranji Trophy or something like that, yeah. somebody might score a tri triple century. Okay, and that will not become hard headlines. True. But if India does something good against, say, UK or Australia or New Zealand, any of these Western countries, mm -hmm. so if if India gets international recognition, then oh, that's so glorious! Such a great cricketer this is. Okay. It becomes like that. So basically, the idea is that this this need for to some extent validation from the West, mm. which is, it was very much there. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily a good thing, but Prabhupada tapped it. And it's not just need for validation from the West that Prabhupada took it much further. If somebody in the West says that in, what India is good, India is great, that's something people appreciate that. But validation is one thing. Beyond validation is adoption. That is much bigger. Adoption by the West. And even more than adoption is propagation. Oh, so it, is the, it is the West that is coming and propagating. <laughs> so that was remarkable. So you yeah. could say validation itself is great. Yes. But then there is adoption. Mm -hmm. But beyond adoption is propagation. So Prabhupada would often jolt people at that time by saying that Bhagavad Gita is the book of India. It's the wisdom of India. And Indians should be sharing it with all over the world. But instead, he says, in yeah. India, I have to give, get people from America to share it here. <laughs> so that is the way he would jolt. Uh, so, so in one sense, Prabhupada also saw that the, in, the, the great Indian love for the country mm -hmm. is there, could be used hmm, uh, for raising people's awareness and appreciation and adoption of the of the Bhagavad Gita of the Sanatan Dharma of India. So in that sense, this nationalism or generally the word nationalism has okay, you want to reflect on something before I go to the next point? Yeah, basically I just want to appreciate how you brought these two points for Srila Prabhupada, uh, Prabhupada endeavors and how Srila Prabhupada <clears throat> Or the market of <laughs> India in terms that okay, he brought the white elephant. Generally, we study like that as white dancing elephant, and then how how there was a flow between basically 1945 till 60, and then in 70, how Popad appearance with the foreign disciples was remarkable, and yeah, certainly now means yes, we I had appreciation for Popad earlier also, but now that appreciation by this type of explanation is just has really increased a lot so that you mm. points yes certainly the, the the cricket one and the analogy the cricket analogy how <laughs> the person yeah. is yes 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 you have conquered you have conquered there so yes mm. so you now there are, see there are two words the nationalism yeah and there's patriotism so the word nationalism is generally used in a negative context. Patriotism is used in a positive context. 
so now there is a reason for that what they say especially the two world wars and especially the second world war that the common history goes that went because of nationalism german nationalism german pride in the nation nazism so that's why after that in the west at least there is a significant attempt to try to dilute and dissolve national consciousness mm -hmm. so so it they say it caused by german nationalism but in nationalism in general, general mm, other countries also joined in so that time attempt was to therefore dilute and dissolve nationalism and that's why i say for example europe joined together and formed the formed the european union and then they also tried to divide germany into two parts so that you know the two parts would be opposed to each other and there would not be any unity Mm. That was also one of the reasons why India and Pakistan were divided. And of course, they had their other ulterior motives. Britain had that. But the point is that while Prabhupada recognized that nationalism can be a problem, it can be from a political perspective, it can cause conflicts. From a spiritual perspective, it can lead to a identification other than what we are, Atma. But from a devotional perspective, it, it can be it is a higher sentiment. Hmm, yes, it is a higher sentiment. Yeah. And that can be if you consider a higher sentiment can be linked with the highest sentiment. Wow. Higher sentiment is the is the love for God and love for all living beings in service to God. Hmm. So the high so Prabhupada says in the Ishopanishad purports that Kurvane Deva Karmani that purport third verse that all forms of isms, capitalism, communism, nationalism, they can be spiritualized if they are used in the service of God. Yeah. So there is a lot of potential for the, the patriotic love of India and Indians to be used mm. to, to increase as three things, you know, awareness, awareness that India has a great past beyond that is appreciation. That we appreciate it and then we adopt it oh now, of course if we adopt it then we can further go ahead and then we have is advocation of it <laughs> so we can just go forward so i think there's a lot that can be done through the national consciousness okay what is india what does love what is love for bharat if you use that word what does it mean mm. and what is it that we talk about so there's a lot of potential over there. Hmm. Yes, uh, definitely. And bro, uh, regarding this potential and the thing which comes in my mind, there's like in your personal life, what, what we see when the devotees who, who will watch this uh, podcast and they are yours. Yes, definitely. They hear you every time. And so how's your experience, bro? I mean, from the last 10 years, you start exploring the Western outreach and you met different different people over there different universities different mncs how they 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 see now in 2023 how they see our country in bharat or india how they see right now and do do they carry the old impression I means in your previous lecture you is a snake charmer country or is it something different now <laughs> see that is a complex history in one sense if you see the pre-colonial times, the basically British conquered India around 757. There was a battle of Plassey. Yeah, I think that's where. Then 1857 was the battle of independence, which which was not exactly successful. 1947 was successful. So, if you consider pre-colonial hmm, times, the West appreciated India quite a bit. Hmm. There are many thinkers who said, "Oh, this." This wisdom is so great hmm. and so many things like that that was there but once colonial interests came in hmm. then they started some example they wanted to... i was just, just thinking some examples of these type of pre-colonial times lost well there, there are for example there are there is uh was it roman roland or some i forget he said that sanskrit is a language that is that is better in both greek and latin oh. the two classic languages it, says that it has a it has greater, better structure than Greek. I, I'm, I'm not exactly getting it right. And it has a richer vocabulary than Latin. 
So like that, there are many people who appreciated. Mm. So they said that the Upanishads are the most are contain the most profound philosophical thought. And then we have Emerson and Thoreau in America. Oh, yes. They also appreciate. They're a little later, but they also appreciate it. So let's say there was a lot of appreciation initially. Hmm? The rest and then seeking seeking some guidance and some information from our country. I'm not sure it is guidance. Mm -hmm. Just it is it is wisdom that is appreciated uh, because at that time still the West was progressing in industrialization and everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure whether they turned to India for wisdom, but but their idea was that original idea was that this is the is the barbaric land of the savages, and we are going there to civilize them. Mm -hmm. But then they were surprised to see that hey, these people don't seem to be all that uncivilized. They have their own civilization in their own way. So that was surprising for them. But after that, when the colonial interests came up, then the whole idea was the British, unlike the Muslims, Muslims came in India, ruled India. But the British were actually very small okay. in India. They were, even at the peak of their rule, mm -hmm. the British were actually in population, something like less than 0.5% of the people ruling in India. Oh. So less than 0.5 percent. <laughs> so, so how could such a tiny minority rule India? Hmm. So basically, they had to create from Indians a group mm -hmm. who would have their loyalty to the British. Okay. And then yes. they would they will rule rule, <laughs> rule on behalf of hmm. India of the British over India. Oh, yes. So these are what in the Bhakti Nautha Kurs times they're called the Bhadraloka. Oh. So they were the elite educated class. Many of them adopted Western values. So of course, over a period of time, these Bhadraloka also split. So many, some of them adopted the Western ways entirely, but many of them, they felt that India also has something special in its own past. So in one sense, this Bhadraloka, they also themselves later became a part of the independence struggle leaders. Mm. They became independence struggle leaders, many of them, not all of them. So some of them are from this, this society, Badra Loka. Some, yeah, some of them did this. Their idea was Britain wanted these people to be loyal to them. Okay. And many of them were, but not all of them. So these people, as they started presenting, understanding Vedic wisdom and presenting Vedic wisdom. So what the British purpose was that our knowledge, in one sense, our wishes should go down over here through the Bhadra Loka. Okay. How we want to rule, what values we want to teach, what education we want to give. That's what should go down. Mm -hmm. And that's what did happen. But to some extent, some of these Bhadra Loka also went it other way that they learned about Indian tradition, they tried to present it to the Western world. So now Bhakti Vinod Thakur was one among them. Mm -hmm. Bhakti Vinod Thakur didn't exactly, there's not much record of him preaching or talking about Bhakti wisdom or Gaudiya Vaishnava specifically to his bosses. Yeah. yeah. In one sense, he, he focused on doing his work competently, yes. that he was very religious, was well known, but he wrote letters to Emerson, he wrote letters to European thinkers, and he did cultivate a lot of people through his writing, especially newspapers and magazine, his magazines. Mm. Mm. So over a period of time, we're talking about Western perceptions of India, there was, as Western people started learning more about Indian wisdom and started coming, they found a big disjoint that the thoughts were lofty. For example, the philosophy, the wisdom was great. But, but the, uh, the live living that was not was filthy, <laughs> not, not just lot lofty, <laughs> but it was filthy, and this created a big, you could say, cognitive dissonance. There's a lot of difference now. Yeah, it's why. How is it that people who had such lofty thoughts could be so disorganized, could be so utterly? Uh, that's even even true till today. That Western, yeah. yeah. Is still more organized, more. That's true. That's definitely true. But then there are many result causes for this. India was exploited, plundered, 
Yeah. And and it is also true that why was India exported and plundered so often? Mm -hmm. Because it was so prosperous. Nobody wants to plunder a poor country. What is there to plunder? That's why they say it isn't it nothing. Yeah. Yeah. The Choria Jo Hoti eh, Patti Mani Hoti. So so in that sense. <laughs> So India was very wealthy, no doubt about it, and it is still. So post independence, there was, there has been a, it's been a, there's been a change, not really much, because India still adopted the socialist model. So the West did not see India so much from a spiritual perspective as a political perspective, mm -hmm. and it was always, in one sense, juxtaposed with Pakistan, that. Pakistan has tendency to go toward Muslim extremism. India has the tendency to go towards Hindu extremism, something like that. Hmm. But over a period of time, several things happened. It's a, again, if we talk about, this is broadly the West. And if this is India, yeah. by West, we can mean Europe. We can make Europe and America, but primarily America. So what happened is several things from India reached the West. Okay. So one of them is vegetarianism. Mm. It has become, it is slightly varied, but it's vegan, but still very big. And it's clearly while vegetarianism has been, maybe I've been practiced many parts of the world. It clearly comes from India. Mm. And in many ways, Prabhupada was among the first yes. propagators, not just of vegetarianism as a principle, but vegetarianism has an appealing dietary choice yes. that it's not that you have to live the Austrian live, live eating vegetables. Then apart from that, another big export from India is yoga. I would say right now it is, it, it could well be considered to be the biggest spiritual export. Hmm. Now, of course you could say at the material export, the software engineers are gone. <laughs> that's huge by any chance. <laughs> so that is big. But if you focus on that, it is much more spiritual. It is yoga is there. And these two, now apart from that, another thing that has become quite big, not that big, but big is Kirtan. Mm. Mm -hmm. Kirtan is, is seen as a, as a nice holistic form of peaceful entertainment and uh, mm -hmm. peaceful spiritual kind of entertainment. And it has, become big yes. and uh, bhakti yoga or spirituality philosophy that has gone but that's not that much it has not gone that that far into the american heartland but it has gone it is also there india is a land of wisdom that is true so it's the, it's very much possible that in future that will also be appreciated more hmm. We share our spiritual wisdom mm -hmm. with others uh, using the systems of organization, systems of dissemination, basically understand it better in a more organized way. That would be a big thing, big contribution towards that. And I think this can happen at three levels broadly. So if you talk about, maybe this could be the last point we talk about it. If you want to fulfill the purpose of independence, which is not just political, political freedom, but also you know, re restoring the spirituality of India, what make it Bharat. Yeah. So sharing Sanatan Dharma, sharing Indian spirituality, I think it can happen at three broad levels, individually, it can open, offer collectively in the terms of people coming together to form various organizations and groups. Hmm. You could say there's a negative word here, but institutionally and then governmentally. So governmentally means so individually means we Prabhupada started himself as an individual. He took initiative hmm. and he started sharing it. He was all alone. And Prabhupada will often say that I was just young one, one, one person. And if I was able to do so much, how much more can many of us together do? 
So individually also, we should under underestimate the value of a single single individual also transforming. Mm. Then individually, that's something which is the power of every one of us to do can do. Then collectively, we can come more together. As uh, so there are various groups of individuals, ultimately, the Krishna conscious movement also is a group of individuals. An institution has its own official structure and other things, but essentially it's a group of like-minded individuals, collectively. And there's a lot more that could be done by forming focus groups for focused groups for various purposes and for propagating and sharing that. And then governmentally, there are things that are happening. So for example, yoga has been popularized in the Western world. And the government government is secular, but secular doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be disconnected from what is our national heritage. Mm -hmm. So the Gita can be seen as a religious book. It could be seen as a book of religion. It could be seen as a book of wisdom. Now, if we see the book as a, a Gita as a book of wisdom, then that's a wisdom that can benefit humanity at large. Mm -hmm. So why should it not be shared? Mm -hmm. If you keep that in mind, then even the government can play some role in it. Government is emphasizing now Indian knowledge systems. Yes. We call it IKS. Yeah. So these could be, if we as those who are studying and teaching the Bhagavad Gita, if you can present the Gita more as a book of wisdom, mm. it is definitely a book of devotion and religion. But if once it comes to religion and devotion, it, it tends to become sectarian. Even if you don't think it is sectarian, it, that's how it was viewed mm. as a book of wisdom. If you present it, then there is so much more that can be done. So India's independence yeah. is not just the political independence of the land, mm. but it is, it is the spiritual independence, the spiritual freedom of what was special about the land and what was special, the independence to, to understand that, to practice that, to share that. So now the shackles for this independence are not so much external, political, social, cultural. They are more internal, our own misconceptions and our own attachments. Mm. So if we can overcome those, then there's a rich future available for us, both individually as well as collectively, individually as citizens and collectively as a nation. Mm. Actually, you just conquered uh, one of the things. Uh, which generally you, you address nowadays, Bhagavad Gita perspective, <laughs> which you were just mentioning there, Bhagavad Gita, uh, that how if Bhagavad Gita goes, yes, goes out, and after the post independence, then how Bhagavad Gita reflects on, uh, on, on, on the war itself or independence itself? How, how does Bhagavad Gita has a perspective over the independence? Maybe you can speak something on on that more when there's the same thing which I want you, I want you to take it further that yes Bhagavad Gita has a wisdom and then this religion and devotion part so maybe we would like to uh, explain it further. See basically, if you consider the West and East, everyone seeks freedom. Nobody wants to be bound and restricted but in the west it was focused more on liberty at a political level hmm? but in the east especially india it was more of liberation hmm. and it's more at a spiritual level hmm. so it is not so much being swatantra as being mukta hmm? Hmm. so the idea is that even when we consider ourselves satantra, mm -hmm. that that still we remain paratantra in the sense that we have a, we are spiritual beings, but we are bound by our bodies. So that is something which is very much there in spite of everything that we do. We can't avoid that. We are bound to grow old. We are bound to get disease. We are bound to die. So if you have to avoid all those things, just being swatantra is not enough. We want to be mukta. So, so for this purpose, for to be mukta, we liberated 
So now certainly if you want to have you are independent, that can definitely help us. So what is the, so the Bhagavata's focus is, for example, Dharma Samsthapanarthaya. So that is talking about uh, a rule that is virtuous, a rule that is not causing harm to people. Mm -hmm. So in one sense, the spirit of independence, where people are not exploited, people are not manipulated, people are not subjugated unfairly, all that is very much implicit in the Gita. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, the Gita also talks about how the, uh, the whole idea of independence, it, uh, it has, it can be said to have multiple historical origins. Let's say America fought a war for independence from Britain. And after that war for independence was fought, there was democracy. Yeah. But if you see the char charter of rights that you talk about, the equality, all living beings are born equal before, are equal before God. Hmm? So the idea of equality of all, which is what in the, and one purpose that independence is meant to be achieved. It is talked about in the Gita long ago. Say mm -hmm. when it talks about all living beings are children of God, 14.4. .4, or it talks about how everybody is enfranchised. That everybody has a spiritual right, mm -hmm. even if they have material differences. So the ideas that make independence appealing that are actually, that make independence sacred. They are very much there in the Gita. And just to talk about independence, you know, there's freedom. Often there's freedom from. Yeah. And then there is freedom for. So what are you getting yourself free from? And what are you getting yourself free for? Mm. So, okay, India got free from political rule. But then we could say, unfortunately, political rule we got free from. Yes. But in many ways, if we, we, we got it for cultural subordination, cultural subjugation, free India has adopted so much of the Western culture and Western values. Mm -hmm. So unless we have something truly higher, we will just actually in one sense shift our subordination from one thing to another thing. So politically free, still India remains culturally betrothed, culturally enslaved. So what the Gita says is that freedom has to be from our own weaknesses. Kama, Krodha, Loba, Moham, Matsarya, our own weaknesses and freedom for our own potentials. Mm. Our potentials, there are material potentials we have in terms of the abilities and interests that we've been given and the spiritual potential we have in terms of the Satchitananda features of the soul which can be realized. So the Gita's focus is much more on this kind of freedom. So th this is how to free ourselves from our own Kama, Krodha, Moha and how to free ourselves for developing our our both Varana Dharma, our potentials as they are given materially and our potentials as we have them spiritually. Oh. This is something which is the key message of the Bhagavad Gita. So it is the Gita is a call for independence, but if it at all you can say it's independence from our lower nature. Mm -hmm. So for our higher nature. Higher nature. So Uddhared Atmanatmanam Natmanam Avasadayet. That, that don't let the lower nature control you. Don't let it drag you down. But let your higher nature manifest. Mm. So from our lower nature, for our higher nature. Mm. Nicely, nicely put, bro. This, uh, this, this last part which we mentioned about freedom from and freedom for. Wow, nicely articulated and <laughs> it's a kind of eye opening. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah, specifically the, the 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 way you play with that those words, freedom for freedom for. You know. <laughs> That's true. You and you put it in between. Yes, now how after even the independence, the culturally we were not growing so much, but yes, we need to realize for for what we we need the freedom. 
Yes, many many times we just got stuck up. Yes, we need to get free, but for what? <laughs> for what? That is more relevant. Thank you. Really. Mm. You want to add some last message to this pro to our discussion? I found that yes, yeah, today uh, yes, our viewers will get a lot of information and a lot of thought provoking ideas uh, about our mission, about the independence, about Bhagavad Gita, and some thoughts we churn today. So. I just thought maybe you can add some cherry on that cake, the, what, we con, what we are going to conclude after that. Yeah. Let me, let me summarize, then I'll uh, add some concluding bit. Sure. Okay. So I started broadly by talking about how when we talk about independence struggle, yeah. what, what is it all about? So, you know, even from if you consider love for country or patriotism, if it can be appreciated from for even a country like UK, then why, why not about it? How much more for India? Mm -hmm. It's not just giving us religious freedom and religious rights, but also is the birthplace of Sanatan Dharma, is the place where Sanatan Dharma is still prominent, very of the many of the monuments are still there, circuit places are there. So you could say spiritual growth is a growth in appreciation. So rather than seeing this as just a mundane occasion, mundane celebration, we can see it as a spiritual celebration also. A celebration of an event that was meant to provide India a greater facility for reclaiming and restoring and rejuvenating its spirituality. Then we talk about Indian history, India's independence struggle, the freedom, freedom struggle. How at one level, its origin was was both political and spiritual. That political freedom was sought and sought so that India's past could be reclaimed. We discussed the meaning of the word Bharata, how it is the light of wisdom, the light, and those who are immersed in the light of wisdom, and they were meant to share that. Mm. Now the Gita also serves the same purpose. But then we discussed about how. India has done decently politically in the post-independence India. So definitely there is a certain level of facility for practicing spiritual growth. And the, the political instability, political turbulence, like, the, like it was there in the other parts of the world or it is there in many parts of the world, that is not there. So that is at least the foundation for practicing spirituality is there. Mm. But spiritually itself, if we consider and there were several setbacks that are slowly being overcome. We talked about partition and the assassination, other things, which were which were which became obstacles. But slowly, those obstacles are being shaken. Uh, are they are being cast aside? Besides, then we just discuss a bit about the Western views of India. How pre-colonial times they were appreciative, and then during, during colonial times they were derisive. And now slowly, so many things from India have gone to the West, yoga, vegetarianism, mm. and then <clears throat> Kirtan to some extent. Yeah. So this can be done much more in future. And then we discussed how, what can, what can be done today. Yep. So this can be done further at an individual level, institutional level, and a governmental level. The individual is very much possible for us institutional level we come together the government level it depends at the government level also things are happening and then finally we discussed from the perspective of the bhagavad gita itself that ultimately when you talk about freedom it is what is it from and what is it for so if you look at only as political freedom then we end up okay we get politically free but then we adopt we end up still culturally subordinated. In fact, we may subordinate ourselves more culturally. The freedom is from our anarthas, from our own lower nature. Yeah. And it is freedom. That means our weaknesses that keep, keep us tied down for our higher nature, that is for our potentials that are uh, both particularly in terms of our talents and interests and spiritually in terms of our the features. And is this freedom that the Bhagavad Gita provided Arjuna 
and there's that freedom that Gita can provide all of us today also. Mm. So, but so that is the theme that uh, the Gita itself is the book can that can fulfill the import of the Independence Day. Yeah. By actually helping us become more internally individually independent, and then we can become more. We can both share and savor more, savor and share more and more the what makes India special, the spirituality that makes India special. Hmm. Oh. Want to add something? Yeah, <laughs> just amazed, again amazed by your. You can say you generally you say Shruti Dhar. I mean, yes, one hour Shruti Dhar, one or two hour. How beautifully you have plotted all the summary points. And having a good churning today, and I'm very grateful for being there with you uh, for discussion this uh, discussion this topic on the Independence Day, Puji. So that, that's so much on my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.